in color. The continuing story of Peyton Place. Starring Dorothy Malone as Constance McKenzie, Ed Nelson as Michael Rossi, Ryan O'Neill as Rodney Harrington, Barbara Parkins as Betty Anderson, Tim O'Connor as Elliot Carson, Christopher Connolly as Norman Harrington, Patricia Morrow as Rita Harrington, James Douglas as Stephen Cord. Betty Anderson Cord was once married to Rodney Harrington. The marriage was brief and unsuccessful. Today, Rodney's grandfather, Martin Payton, begins the crucial phase of his master plan to split Stephen and Betty and pair off Rodney and Betty in order to maintain a Payton heritage that he thinks will do honor to his name. You were posing for a portrait? Yes. Arranged by my grandfather, I assume? That's right. To, uh, to cover that... That bare spot and over the mantel? He's having it painted as a present for Stephen. It's to be a surprise. You done up to look like the mother who deserted him from birth. It'll be a great present. Oh, it'll be some surprise. Well, that's not what was meant. Maybe you uh, forgot the portrait that used to hang in the living room, the portrait that dominated the living room. And maybe you didn't have a choice over what dress to wear. And maybe my grandfather forced you to wear that necklace. Stop it. Did he force you to wear the necklace, Betty? He asked me to wear it. Then, of course, you couldn't refuse. Of course not. It would have been rude. It would have been rude. You know, it's funny because when we first moved into this house as husband and wife, I asked my mother to give you that necklace. It would have been sort of a family, family wedding present. How touching. And of course your mother refused because I wasn't family. And you let it go at that. Oh, you see, it was a patent heirloom and uh, my mother wasn't about to let it go to an outsider. Of course, now you qualify. You married the favorite grandson. And you're very beautiful and very successful. And I'm very thankful you're no longer my wife. Are you? Oh, yes, I am. Because, you see, I don't want a business manager for a wife. Tell me something. How long do you give Stephen for, uh, for shaving in the morning? Is he allowed to go out and have a drink with the boys once in a while? Does he have to be home at 6 o'clock on the nose for cocktails? And another thing, Mrs. Cord, how do you spend your weekends? Is it bridge and uh, golf at the country club? No, you see, I don't dig schedules. I wouldn't enjoy that kind of life. Because you're a coward. A what? You let people talk you out of everything, even our marriage. It could have worked if you'd had any backbone. I'm in kind of a hurry. Then. You're afraid to hear me out. It's been a hard day. No, I don't believe it. You've never had hard days. You don't know what it means to fight for something. Sure, you're willing to rush into somebody else's battle. It's good for the ego. But you never fight for anything you want. Maybe I've got everything I want. Sure. No, I agree with you. You've got everything you want because you've got nothing and you want nothing. Nothing and no one. Mr. Uncommitted. Mr. Cool. You done? No. You don't want to be like us common folk. We know success and failure. We have friends and enemies. But everybody has to love Rodney Harrington. You can't afford to want anything because you can't afford to have an enemy. You're the professional good guy. But if I were you, I'd have had enough of myself by now. No matter how many fancy dresses my grandfather gives you, or how much uh, patent jewelry he lets you wear, that's not going to change you, Betty. Nothing can change you. You're very beautiful and very greedy. And as you get older, you're going to get less beautiful and more greedy. And no matter what you grab for yourself, it'll never be enough. Rodney's staying for lunch? No. Then, perhaps you'll join me. You arrange for him to come here. You fixed it so he'd be here just in time to see me in this dress. Well, it didn't work. He wasn't impressed, so you're wasting your time, Mr. Payton. I hate him. And he hates me.
Washington. Mr. Chandler's here. Uh, you just had my ribs taped. I was wondering if you'd uh, help me into a chair. Help you into a chair. Thanks. Quite a sight, Chandler. Quite a sight. Uh, they told me at the hospital that you picked up the tab. Uh, you didn't know I was such a valuable employee. How do you feel? What's that old joke? It only hurts when I laugh. Give you any idea when you'd be back on your feet? Yeah, I'd take it easy for a couple of days. Let the ribs mend, wrist bruise work itself out. I, I should be back in the job in a week or so. I won't need you back, Chandler. I figured that was probably the reason you sent the car around to pick me up. Tell me, was all that fancy treatment supposed to make it easier for me to take the news, or was it to take me off your conscience? Here's a month's severance pay. Hey, you're a very generous man, Les. Do you want to tell me why I'm getting cast? Let's just say I'm afraid you might be accident prone. Carson, is that it? That's enough. And that's enough to get you out of this town and set up somewhere else. Sorry, I don't want to go. You'll go anyway. Don't push, Les. Do you know what kind of a man Elliot Carson is? Yeah, if I forget, I, I imagine I'll remember when they take this tape off my midsection. Maybe you could laugh off that beating Elliot gave you, but he's just started. He knows your name is Forrest, and he knows what you served time for. And he's hired Stephen Cord to find out everything else he can, to link you with the disappearance of his daughter. I heard. Now, you can dig all he wants. He's not going to find anything. Now, listen, Shatter, I want you out of this town. Relax, Les. Look, I know what you're scared of. No matter how much pressure Carson puts on me, I can take it. And I'm surely not going to mention where we met 20 years ago. I just have to be telling about myself. That's not going to do me much good. And who's going to care anyway about uh, you wanting to kill a wife 20 years ago and she's died already a long time? I want you out of this town. I told you I don't want to go. That's enough to see you halfway around the world. Take it. No, thanks. You're a fool. Be careful. If you're going to court and press charges against Elliot, you'll find yourself on the witness stand answering a line of questions that'll give him everything he needs to know about your past. I got nothing to hide. Don't count on Stephen Court knowing that. He'll drag you through every minute of your sordid life until he finds out the real reason behind that fight. You know, Les, I can respect a guy like Carson. If he's got a beef, he's got the guts enough to let me know about it face to face. But it's not easy to think much of a guy who sells you out when you got a lot of trouble moving from here to there. I'm not interested in your respect, Chandler. From now on, you're on your own. I'm used to that. Get out. Sure, sure. Oh, you, uh, you want to give me a hand here again? Thanks. Oh, uh, can I use your name as a reference? Hello, Chandler. What do you want, Wilbur? Mr. Payne wants to see you. What about it? I don't know. He just asked me to pick you up. Did he forget I'm running his business for him? I just drive his buggy, Mr. Harrington. I have several things to do before I can waste time arguing with him today. Is that what you want me to tell him? I'll come when I've attended to a couple of matters. But you will come. Wait for me at the front gate. Yes, sir. She's upstairs meeting Matthew. Look, how about stepping in out of your shot a minute? Oh, um, I put some coffee on a couple of minutes ago. Oh, fine.
bet you went to visit Chandler at the hospital. Yes. Well, I thought you and Elliot were going to keep her away from him. Cream and sugar, right? Yes. Oh, don't even come sorry. I know I have no right to knock the door off the hinges every time something goes wrong. I know you put a roof over her head here, and well, Connie, I, I'm sorry. Mike, I understand. Well, I wish I did. If it just if something happens to this girl, I think I never forgive myself or you or Elliot. Or... We had no idea she was going to see Chandler. We asked her not to. Well, you can't ask this girl. You've got to tell her. I mean, she has no idea. She's not old enough to realize what can happen to her with Chandler. Wouldn't it be easier, Michael, if, if you understood yourself? You know, you keep talking about Rachel as if she were 12 years old. And that isn't the way you see her. And it isn't the way she is. She's a young woman with a will and a mind of her own. All right, all right. I know she's not 12 years old. She's not 30. But believe me, she's not equipped enough to handle a twisted mind like Chandler's. I mean, she has to be kept away from him. Well, that's Elliot. Hi, Mike here? Yes. Are you all right? I'm fine. Yeah. Hello, Mike. Hi. Why the house call? Rachel. Ah, oh, I see. Well, she went to see Chandler because she thought she could help us. Well, you've got to set us straight. Well, I've tried. I'm also trying something else, trusting her a little. Well, you can't let a girl like her wade through a problem like this on her own. I'd, uh, I'd better go up with Rachel. What it all boils down to, Mike, is that I'm not her father. I just don't have the kind of control over her that I should have. But I've done everything I can to keep Chandler away from her. <laughs> I'll say you have. But what have you done to keep her away from Chandler? Well, I'm not a police force, Mike. I mean, I can't be in 18 different places at once, and I'm not about to lock her in a room every time I go outside. Well, I guess the only thing to do is to send her off. Send her off? Where? There's some good school. I'm sure we'll find a place the authorities would agree on. Well, you say that with about as much emotion as you'd show if you were making an incision. Well, it would be good for her. Keep her away from Chandler. She'd get a chance to get a better education than she can around here. And give her a chance also to mix with people more her own age. She's had a tough enough time making adjustments around here. We can't just push her off into a whole new world. I mean, she's not ready for that. Well, she's not ready for Chandler either. No. I wouldn't think of sending her away. Not now. Why not now? Because she might dig up something on Chandler that you couldn't beat out of him? I'll just forget you said that. Don't forget it. Answer it. Ellie, come on, look. I'm not trying to, to get you to forget about Allison. What I'm trying to do is to get you to start thinking about Rachel. I think about Rachel as a member of my family, Mike. All right, then prove it. By helping me to get her out of here. No, she has a home here now, and I'm not going to take her away from that. Ellie, look, I brought her here in the first place because I trusted your judgment. Because I knew that a man that had learned the value of life by giving up so many years of his own wouldn't gamble with someone else. When you brought her here, she became my responsibility, not yours. And I intend to use my judgment, not yours. If we send her away now, she'll live for the rest of her life with a sense of rejection and, and, and distrust. Well, at least we'll know she's alive. Look, what we're talking about here is, is Rachel's interest, not yours, not mine. Let's let her make the decisions. But even a suggestion of not wanting her will make her withdraw. She'll, she'll crawl right back into the same shell we found her in. You say you trust her. Let her decide. Oh, I don't know. Neither one of us should be playing God, I suppose. Maybe it should be up to Rachel. All right. But you'll have to present the choice to her. And make sure that she understands it's your idea to send her away and not mine. time you learn to be a lady. No more opening up doors for yourself, no more cooking, no more cleaning up the apartment, and no more bouncing up and down the stairs. Uh, how are you gonna manage? Oh, I'll manage. And no feeling sorry for yourself. I'm just feeling sorry for you. 